Our marriage champion has 42 years experience as a faithful husband. He's the father of four with four grandchildren. Dave Carter is a clinical member of the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Along with speaking, counseling, and writing books, Dave is the pastor responsible for counseling ministries at the First Evangelical Free Church of Fullerton in California. And Dave, I want to apologize that I haven't given that full amplification, oh, all the credentials. Each time I've been so eager to jump into yeah. this. That is some big church that you're yeah. in charge of the counseling ministries. It's a little overwhelming at times, but you know, I get about 50 lay counselors. They have great help. They do a lot of work. So, And in a state that we might think is, well, a tough place to champion marriages. Well, actually, we have a lot of marriage ministries, a lot of marriage classes, a lot of premarital. We have two different kinds of premarital classes. So, I kind of oversee all that, and it, it's, it's kind of exciting. It's very exciting, in fact. So I love it. Well, we surely are glad. And uh, today, you know, we're going to end on a real positive because we're looking at uh, protecting, preserving our marriages. We won't get everything and we'd hope to, but you did mention yesterday uh, about respect. Mm. And I brought the, the king of the castle crown here. <laughs> Uh, so important for the man <clears throat> yep. to feel that he is the Respect. king of his castle. Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of uh, wives will say things like, I went after the affair, after he's had an affair, I just trusted him explicitly and all that kind of But when I turned to the husband and asked him if he felt trusted, this is what I hear. I wasn't trusted. I was just taken for granted. Mm. And being, feeling taken for granted and being trusted are two different things. Trust is a living, vibrant relationship. You talk about test when you're trusting something. When you're just making assumptions that they would never do something, that's taking people for granted. In the book, I have a little respect quiz that you can kind of fill out on each other. And I think it's real important in this culture not to take anything for granted. Now, some people may still be choking on the, uh, the 1949. Mm -hmm. the, my husband is ideal, Mrs. Jack Smith tells why. I mean, this goes back to an era where we were also told to meet the husband at the door with our hair freshly quaffed and so on and so on. But you know, Ephesians 5.33 is timeless. It's mm. the Word of God. And uh, I have the amplified version here. I want to put it on the screen. Are you ready for this? Okay. This is what God's Word says. And a few extra words, but the truths are all here. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. Oh, I've run out of air. Now, as a husband, as a man, uh, do you need all this? You don't need to be worshipped quite like that, but you do need to be respected. You do need to know that you're woman, your wife looks up to you, that she is glad she married you. She tells her friends how glad she is rather than complains about you to all of her girlfriends. Uh, yeah, you do need some of that. Uh, there is a book out there called The Proper Care and Feeding of a Husband yes. that I, <laughs> I think it has some very good things to say. I've seen her interviewed on Larry King. Haven't yeah, we? but I will also say, you know, it works both ways. You know, you Men need to respect their wives as well. I'll give you a good illustration. Now, currently, I buy all the groceries and I do all the cooking in our house. Wow. So, yeah. Where that's that the, mold? That's the typical response. But I want to tell you something. Moira, I have 27 more years of doing that before I catch up to my wife who did it all on the front end. Okay? So, it's what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And you, you have to have that kind of attitude. A good marriage has sequences like that where maybe you're the all giving, you're the ones doing all the giving right now, but you will do some receiving, I promise you, if you really work out that reciprocity like that. So, yeah, it's just the time. Now, now respect is, is shown in, in, in listening, in, uh, in being attentive, in, in looking yeah. up to and allowing leadership. Yeah. But, you know, here, this maybe is important, too. And, and I thought I should put this on the screen. This is a good news, bad news thing. Sex is the best antidepressant known to males. It is. It is. Now, some it, women think this is not important. Oh, they're, they're fooling themselves. Food is the best antidepressant for most women. But Ooh. sex is for men. 
And the reason is it's a mood altering experience. Mm -hmm. It elevates the mood, it lifts them out of the mundane, it transports them to a new arena and, and feeling. So yeah, until they become so depressed they can't be sexual and that can happen. They, that is it, that's what they need. You point out too, and I think this is very interesting, this is a God thing, that oxytocin, mm. the bonding mm. hormone, the feel good hormone, mm. is not released in the man with someone other than his wife. Oh, absolutely. Women often have spikes in oxytocin when they're nursing their babies, and that, that attachment, that closeness. But men spike in oxytocin levels when they have sex with their loved one. It does not spike when they masturbate or when they have sex with prostitutes. We, they, that's been measured on college campuses. I mean, there's weird things going on out there as far as research goes, but that is documented, well documented. That's why married students get better marks. Uh -huh. mm, all exactly. those things. Um, trust, respect, eliminate boredom. I highlighted those. Mm -hmm. We're talking about protecting now and preserving that marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and you say that to the degree that you can forgive, you can rebuild respect. Oh, I think you can. It goes like this. To the degree you can forgive, to that degree you can start rebuilding respect. To the degree you rebuild respect, you can start rebuilding trust to that degree. And when you rebuild trust, you can start rebuilding love. Forgiveness, respect, trust, and love. You'll never have love until you have respect and trust. And mm -hmm. it's all dependent on thorough cleansing, a thorough forgiveness. Not only in the case of adultery, or infidelity and, and other kinds of emotional affairs, but it's also in daily living, we have a great gift from God that few couples really utilize and draw upon, and that is a cleansing, a daily cleansing process where we ask forgiveness of what we have done that day to injure the relationship and we don't go to bed mad or hurt. Mm. But we too often do it just our own way. We go to bed mad, we go to bed upset, and it, that bitterness begins to grow and retaliation. Just yeah, grow it's apart. incremental. It's the frog in the kettle. And we don't realize how bad off we are until something tragic happens to our relationship, like an affair. In this case. You said yesterday that, you know, you have to give time in the process of forgiveness and restoration. Mm -hmm. But what's the average if there's been unfaithfulness? Well, actually, when I do therapy with couples involved in adultery, I see them 12 to 15 sessions. And my goal is to stabilize the marriage to where if they continue on the path that they are at the end of the time I see them, they will do just fine. But we say basically you don't finish off recovering from an affair until after you've gone through the second anniversary. The first anniversary is very tumultuous and troubling and upsetting because a lot of things come flooding back and for a day or two the, or three. The anniversary of the exposure. That's right, the anniversary mm -hmm. of the exposure. It, it's the same for any kind of major loss. If you lose a spouse, we tell you the second anniversary is the big marker. If you lose a parent, second anniversary is a big marker. So it's true here too. Okay, okay. we, we want to reinforce and, and protect okay. what is good. Um, the eight greats. Oh, eight greats, I love that. Okay, every couple has developed over its history, a series of what I call eight great experiences. So the husband makes his list and the wife makes her list and they can't involve babies or children and they can't involve your wedding day. So they, these are our memory making These are events. your highlights. If you're gonna list the eight great experiences in your relationship, and they can include dating experiences. It doesn't have to be after marriage. Okay. So you each make your own list. Most happily married couples who have some good history at least will have a tendency to have four or five of those identical. So you put those in a list, she gets number six, you get number seven, she gets number eight. Those eight experiences, you can redo those anytime, anywhere, and they will bring back all that infatuation again. It's stored in your brain. So I tell couples, when you say goodbye to Dave Carter out of the counseling office, you take the next 18 months and you repeat those eight experiences. I don't care what it costs you. It'll always be cheaper than paying for an attorney, always, okay? <laughs> and I teach them new things and there are some old things. The old things and the new things, when combined with the new things that they've earned in counseling, really help to integrate and s straighten up and salvage and strengthen that marriage. 